far you have come on your own, but never alone. Through the rain and through the shine, here's your moment. It's your time. You stood tall. And now you see, standing in your destiny, 100 women growing strong, 100 women where you belong. You stood tall, and now you see, you have reached your destiny woman woman As people of African descent, we offer this land recognition in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island in the efforts and deliberate intentions toward decolonization. As people of African descent, we acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that sustains us, express deep gratitude to its indigenous peoples, and pledge to honor our dignity and divinity that ultimately connects us all by Kay Johnson. Welcome to 100 ABC Fireside Chats. 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women is a bold project initiated by co-authors and co-founders the Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green and Donna Joan Simmons. Our mission is to celebrate and archive the professional accomplishments of trailblazing black women from all across Canada. The goal is to create an ever-expanding database available for current and future generations via print media, public and private libraries, as well as our website, which is www.100abcwomen.ca. In addition to our fireside chats on topics that matter to all communities, such as education, healthcare, entertainment, creative arts, trade union, and so much more, we offer biannual book launching galas and biannual symposiums. The co authors and co founders would like to take this opportunity to thank each of you for attending today's fireside chat. We now that you will find these sessions educational and inspirational. So sit back, relax, and hear from our brilliant and talented honorees. Good day, everyone. I'm Donna Joan Simmons, co-author, co-founder, and the architect of the 100 ABC project. Today's conversation is about tips to help build your child's confidence. With Kathy, McDonald, Janet Wright Grosvenor, and Michelle Monroe, who are leaders on this topic. Today's inspirational conversation is being moderated by Tanika Wedderburn, who is a child and youth care practitioner. She's a strong advocate for vulnerable and marginalized children and youth. Before we get started, I'd like to quote my dear friend, Norma Faye Nicholson. She says, and I think this is quite appropriate for this event, as leaders, we have incredible opportunities to change someone's life every day. Over to you, Takia. Thank you so much, Donna, and good afternoon to everyone. 
Right. So very excited for this um, very exciting topic that we have this afternoon. So we are going to be discussing tips for building your child's confidence. So I would like to introduce our first panelist this afternoon, Michelle Monroe. So Michelle is a trained social worker, parent, caregiver, engagement specialist, innovative community developer, and she is transformational, uh, transformational thought leader. She has worked with, within education for over 20 years as the coordinator for parent, caregiver, and community engagement in the TDSB, Canada's largest school board. She has spearheaded engagement policy and professional development, cultivated frontline engagement staff and school councils and coached principals and vice principals on leading parent caregiver engagement. Michelle also has two gorgeous children. Our next panelist this afternoon is Reverend Jeanette Wright Grosner, also known as Pastor Jay. So Jeanette is a former youth coordinator, is an international evangelistic pastoral minister, founder of Grosner Ministries, various affiliations and associated counseling ministry, youth and young adult ministry, and author and publisher of children's books and book series. And our third panelist for this afternoon is Kathy McDonald. Kathy is a longtime Brampton resident. She's also known as the general. <laughs> she has been actively involved with the Peel District School Board as a parent volunteer since 2001. She began her four year term as trustee of Ward 3 and and four in Brampton on December 1st, 2014. Kathy's key priorities are to help each child realize his or her full potential, to work with the community to support student success through increased funding, to work with the board to improve student success in math and to advocate for increased teaching assistance for students with special education needs. All right, so ladies, so excited that you can all be, be here this afternoon and also as well for all of our attendees. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, taking time out of your, your, sun, your Sunday to be with us um, this afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna start off with Michelle. So good afternoon, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So let, I think we should jump right, right into it. So Michelle, I'm going to start with uh, our first question for you. So Michelle, I understand that building the confidence of children who identify as two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgendered plus is really important to you. Can you share with us why and how parents and caregivers can do so? Thank you so much, Takia. You know, when I was invited to participate in this talk, uh, the first thing that came to me was this would be one of the areas I wanted to address. One, and I think most importantly, I'm a parent. Uh, and I'm a parent who has actually been parenting a child who's been moving through this stage. And I wanted to just flag parents and caregivers attention, particularly in our community on this issue, because so many of our children are living in silence in our homes and we don't even know it. And I'm hoping that me just saying this here openly in this space will enable many of us as parents, caregivers, and guardians to be able to begin to think about, are we paying attention? Are we having conversations with our children about their identity? Have we asked them? And I'm speaking very young right up till teens. And I know many of us are very uncomfortable with talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer plus issues. But when we recognize what the statistics are as it relates to children who identify as such or children who are questioning, it is really important that in our homes, we start asking the questions. You know, over 30% of the Canadian population that identifies um, as two-spirit LGBTQ plus is between the ages of 15 and 24. So it is a very young population. And if I start to speak to the statistics about within our community and our children and how they're faring, we absolutely know that it's very possible that right now in our home, we actually have children who are identifying 
or who are questioning or who are moving through this in silence. And so I really wanted to say to parents and caregivers and guardians, let's start asking the questions at home. Let's start starting the conversation, regardless of the age of our children, uh, in terms of getting a sense of how they identify, how they identify in terms of their bodies, how they identify in terms of their looks, how they identify in terms of their emotions. Our ability to do that begins to let them know that we are open to the conversation and that we're not going to stop loving them because of how they're thinking and feeling. Because I know in my home, my little one, they actually thought that we wouldn't love them. They actually thought that we wouldn't still care for them. So they actually decided that they wouldn't tell us. And then we started seeing the signs. And the signs that we started seeing was a child that was excelling in school, all of a sudden was failing. A child that had a great rambunctious laugh and full of life started disappearing, started isolating, started being alone. And that's when we started asking what's wrong because we know something was happening. And so then we started questioning and inquiring and that's when our, our little one came out to us and started speaking their truth about what they've been living and what they've been experiencing because one, we broke the silence. So I'm asking you to break the silence and ask. We were rigorously preparing our children to deal with racism and anti-Black racism, but we were not paying attention to gender identity. And because of that, we nearly lost our baby. And I don't want any parent or caregiver to lose your baby. So you may not be comfortable with the conversation, so have it. And if you don't know how to have it, just ask your children, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How are you liking yourself? Are you loving yourself? Is there everything about yourself you love, right? And if you're not comfortable with this language of two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, can I say just Google it? Just Google it. The language is there. You can become familiar with it if you're uncomfortable with it. But I'm just going to give a couple tips. And those tips are not from expertise. Those are coming from a mother who is walking the journey and the tips that I learned that I want to share. The first thing, break the silence, have a conversation about it. Ask the question. Your children will definitely answer. Lead with love. Don't leave with heartache. Don't leave with screaming, yelling, lead with love and leave with inquiry An inquiry that you're willing to learn, but also be open that you're willing to listen and also do the work. A little of the work we've got to do ourselves. We can't explain our children to explain everything to us all the time. So I'm encouraging you, get on Google, find out what it means. Go to the you know community agencies that support this. I mean, I had to do a lot of work, a lot of work to get the information, to get the supports for my children. And I wanted to do that work. So I'm not leaning on them solely to do all of that work. And can I say, let us not fear therapy. Can I say that again? Let us not fear therapy. Therapy is essential for our mental health and well being, but it's also essential for our children. So reach out to get the supports and the help that your child may need to help them move through this actual stage and phases. And can we please be cautious of our language? Sometimes when our children brings this to us, we think they're going through a phase or they'll get through it or you know, in my language, we say, I just said, ting them, I go on through, and we are going to let them leave it. It isn't. It is their lived experience, and they need us as the essential caregivers in their lives to hear them and provide them the space to be and provide the space to be who they are in our presence so we can nurture love and care for them in the way that they're needing. We know that many of our children, particularly those who identify as black or of African descent, are either leaving home and being pushed out of home because they don't feel safe or parents and caregivers are not accepting their identities. We know what happens when our children end up on the streets, right? We know that they're now dealing with various forms of homelessness. They're now dealing with mental health and well-being. They're now dealing with meeting their basic needs and it just spirals. So let us begin the dialogue so we can keep our children safe and we can keep them at home and provide them with the supports they need. All right, Taki, I'll stop there and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Wow.
There is so much to unpack from what, um, from what you spoke about, Michelle. And I just want to commend you and thank you for, for, uh, for sharing that, that very personal um, sentiment with us and your own personal experience with it, um, with, with your, your children. Um, I don't even know where to begin. You, you touched on so many different topics, but I think just starting with, with the education that you spoke about, and I think it, it's very important that as you, as you mentioned, you know, we need to start with, uh, with educating ourselves first and foremost, and um, that will sort of help us to begin having that dialogue and that conversation with, um, with, with children. So thank you again, Michelle. Um, all right, so just moving right along. Um, all right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Reverend Jeanette. So Jeanette, um, so the first question that I have for you is, if you can define the word and definition of confidence in your own words as it relates to children. Okay, well, first of all, hello everyone. <laughs> I wanna acknowledge everyone out there, especially the panelists and our wonderful tech people and everyone behind the scenes. Um, I think it's important that we understand, and it's very similar to what Michelle was stating, which is very important that as adults, we tend to, we have our own strategies on how we deal with life and life's problems. And our problem level is going to be very different from that of a child. And so what would determine the definition of confidence? It varies depending on the situation. But with a child, confidence doesn't always necessarily mean to be big and bold and strong, but confidence can just be something that they need to know within themselves. And as Michelle was saying, to allow them to value themselves. We think confidence comes from us bearing ourselves and how we portray ourselves outwardly. But I think for children, it's more of an inwardly thing because you have other children who are very bold and strong and personality big. I mean, a bully can be very big, bold and loud. It doesn't necessarily mean that person is confident. And so with children, I think it's very important that we have to determine how they're feeling within themselves as opposed to how they project and what you see on the outside. Children have always been taught, and I, and I, I think too as a cultural thing, and I think most of my panel here are West Indian offspring, that we were taught to be seen and not heard. And my friend Michelle said it beautifully, you have to allow the children to be heard. We don't expect them to come and be rude about it, but we have to know what's going on inside and we have to encourage them so that they're able to share how they're feeling inside. So when we apply any type of encouragement and, and, and try to lift their spirits and try to build them up emotionally and, and spiritually or whatever the aspect may be, that we're not just doing affirmations. I think affirmations are wonderful, but at the same point, is it something that our children are just repeating because they know it's something they should repeat? Or is it something that they truly believe within themselves? Because the confidence comes from inside. It's sort of like a self-motivation. When you have the inner core building outward, nobody can destroy you from the inside in. And you got to make sure that you have that foundation within you to be able to withstand what comes at you. Because, you know, they say, uh, what is it? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. We live in a social media world. And right now, the majority of what is causing grief is pain from words, words that we use, words that we're not sure of. And so to me, confidence for a child is being valued, not just from other people, but to value themselves because they have to know that they do matter. And when you know you matter, then you tend to deal with things on a different level. And I think that's my definition of what a child should have as confidence. Thank you so much, Jeanette. You're very welcome. Yeah, I just want to um, just sort of go back to a few points that you made. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of, I really like what you said about um, in terms of the approach 
working, you know, when, when you are speaking with a child, because I think it, it's very true. I think oftentimes as adults, sometimes we, we do forget um, sometimes when, when we are interacting with children that, you know, the way, as you said, the way that, that they process information is very different and our approach needs to be, needs to be a little bit different as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing, sharing that, um, that tip with, with, uh, with us. And I'm sure a lot of us can, can reflect back on, um, interactions with, you know, family, parents, um, other peers as well when we were children and, you know, we can sort of reflect on what some of those interactions look like. So thank you very much, Jeanette. All right, so moving along. So Kathy, <laughs> good afternoon, Kathy. All right, so my question for you, Kathy, is can you name the top three things parents can do to nurture their self-esteem? Thank you so much for that question. And thanks everyone and, you know, it's amazing. It's a great segue to my first point, um, because as Pastor Jeanette said, um, self-affirmations are important, and I believe in self-affirmations, but as she mentioned, they should not just be meaningless, making sure the kids understand what they're saying and believe what they're saying. And I think we have to, with our self-affirmations, we have to also value their identities, right? value their ethnic identities, their heritage. And I think it is very important that we speak to our kids and remember, for example, in the education system, our children are navigating some very often hostile environments, right? All in the pursuit of trying to get an education. So I think it's important that we value that and build up our children each day as they're going out into the world. Because a lot of us, as you say, we have West Indian heritage. Some of us are first um, you know, immigrants uh, to the country, maybe first generation um, parents. And it's very important to understand that the school system, it's not a neutral loving place all the time for our children. And, you know, we have children that we were going to school and hearing from adults who actually have a duty to care for our children. They say to our children, oh, you're dumb because you're black. Or, you know, nothing, you, you know, you'd have a teacher say, oh, they're not, black children are not like our race. Nothing you can do can help them. These are complaints that come across my desk as a trustee of the board. And these are what our children have to navigate. So it's so important to, not only build them up before they leave, but when they come home, you know, have a debriefing and build them up again, because a lot of them have been stripped down, right? Deflated. The second thing I think is very important to do is very important to make sure that your kids know that you are approachable, regardless of what it is. And as Michelle said, if we, if the children have something that they feel oh, mommy's going to get upset or you, you, you're not going to love them. I think that is, you, you, we need to make sure we pay attention to our kids' moods, body language, the clues, the invitations that they give us, right? And make sure that they are reassured that regardless of whatever they're going through, whatever they have done, we may not condone, you know, their behavior. So let's say they went to the store and stole a candy, right? We're not going to say good job, right? but we will be there to support them. They need to come to us, right, for help. If it's they got a bad mark in school, if they're struggling with their identity, whatever the issue is. You know, I have my kid, I have four kids from age 24 to nine. And I, you know, with my 24 year old, I said to him, I still say to him, I said, if you go out somewhere and you know, you, you just need me to come and pick you up, whatever the situation is, no questions asked, just call me and say, mom, I don't want to ask me anything, but just come and pick me up. Your kids need to know that they can count on you for that support, especially in time of crisis, right? In times of doubt. Another thing we don't talk about is suicide in our community, right? And a lot of kids don't feel that they can go to their parents when, let's say, I'm questioning, hmm, can I go to my mom, right? How are, are my, is my dad going to kick me out of the house, right? Is my family going to shun me, right? Is it if I have 
uh, something that I need to tell them in terms of they have expectations for me and I want to do a different path, right? How do I deal with that? And we need to make sure that the kids know we're there for them. And the third thing I think is really important to monitor their social media and their friends. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, how do you do that? Because I think as parents, we have to realize that there comes a time, whether we like it or not, where we will not be the most influential people in our children's lives. Their friends are going to be very important in their lives. So I think we need from day one to teach our children, one, how to choose friends wisely, right? Because that is going to come, become very important. So we need to guide them. And even in kindergarten, when you see them hanging out with kids and you figure, I don't like little Tommy, how he's behaving, talk to have conversations about why Tommy is probably not the best person to, you know, play with at the park. These are very, because when they're 15, we want to make sure that the friends that they're surrounding them, because these are the people that would influence them, tell them the dares, kind of guide them different ways, could mislead them or lead them down a different path, right? So also like on social media, I say to parents, you know, I t my kids, for example, they will not, they don't, as when they're uh, little in elementary school, they will not have a cell phone, right? Some parents might be okay with it, but I said, we need, to, I think, I strongly, especially in my line of work as a trustee, would encourage parents to pay attention to your kids' social media, what they're doing with their phone. I wouldn't encourage parents to even have their kids at night keep their phone in their room. You're going, the kid is going to bed, you take their computer and their phone. Because, you know, I, I often speak to parents and I say to them, how many parents know what omegaly is, right? Invariably, they don't know. Now, omegaly is a chat it's it's a random it's it's like a, a web app it's a website where you can randomly be paired with total strangers it's an anonymous website right you don't have to give it doesn't verify your age it doesn't take any um addresses right you are paired randomly with total strangers so you may be sleeping or you have put your little um kid to sleep at eight o'clock and they're randomly talking to a stranger across the world. You don't know where that fiber octave table is ending up, right? And they can be exposed to any manner of evil. You can be surprised to know what people will do on a screen. It's anonymous, right? But you're sleeping and you think your kid is in bed um, sound asleep. But there's a stranger. And all you need to identify with Omega Lee is you and stranger, there is no way to trace that person and you don't know what they're expect, exposing your kids to. Kids are lured into committing suicide. They get exposed to all manner of indecent acts and even live murder and torture you can get exposed to, right? Because a random pairing of people. I think it's really also from time to time, check in and see what your friends are saying in the chat because this affects their mental health, right? And also these sort of, you know, go over some of the things that they're exposed to, which is really, I think, extremely important because mental health and a lot, we don't talk about suicide, you know, we talk, it's like the unwritten, oh, we don't speak about it. It's happening. Just on Friday, as someone went to a funeral for a 12 year old little black girl that committed suicide at the precious tender age of 12, our kids are committing suicide mental health is through the roof. COVID has not made the situation any better. And these are the things I think that we need to really pay attention to so that we can encourage our kids to be confident and build them their self-esteem. Thank you so much, Kathy. Wow. Um, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> you mentioned you hit on some really, really good, excellent points. I mean, first thing that that program you mentioned, the Omega Lee, I've never, never heard of it, never heard of it before, but definitely something to, uh, to, to be aware of. Definitely yeah. that, that there even is and a program I'll it for you. It's O-M-E-G-L-E mm -hmm. -E, and encourage parents to Google it because it's okay. something that a lot of parents aren't even aware that kids are using. And it's very scary. Yeah. Right. What they can yeah. be exposed to. Go on it and just see, you see what you get exposed to, right? And it to underscore the importance of not, and, and 
your kids may think, oh my goodness, you're straight. But no, a lot of parents and cop, and I tell people, look at, for example, police officers. They don't let their kids uh, sleep with their cell phones. A lot of them, you speak to them because oh. they know why and they understand what's going on out there, right? You a lot of people in education, look at the people that are very aware of what children are exposed to and just see how they parent. They don't. A lot of celebrities, they would tell you, they don't. Bill Gates, kids didn't get a cell phone till they were 16, right? These are the people making these things for our consumption. And we're letting our children lap up these things at young age, like five and six. But the people creating it, the Nintendo creator, their kids don't play with their, these games, right? Yeah. Yeah, Puff, um, uh, Snoop Doggy Dog. His kids didn't listen hmm. to have, you know, his songs. So we have to really monitor what people are throwing to our kids to consume. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it, um, the other point that that you mentioned as well about in terms of, you know, having a a debrief, having a debrief with with. Um, with your children, you know, after school and asking them questions is really important and really staying, staying involved because that, you know, as you mentioned as well, that in this day and age, things are moving so quickly, right? So it's oftentimes, you know, um, a lot of parents and caregivers may not be taking that time to, to really debrief with them. And um, it is very important because as, as, as you mentioned, the importance of staying involved, knowing who the, um, who your children are communicating with, whether that be virtually or in person at school is extremely important. Um, all right, so just moving right along. Uh, so I have another question for Miss Jeanette, Reverend Jeanette. All right, so my next question for you, Reverend Jeanette is, does confidence in children differ from adults? Um, absolutely. Absolutely, because I think I mentioned before, what we consider important is the priorities of life. You know, as parents, we have to put a roof over their heads, we have to put clothes on their backs and food in their bellies and still try to have money left over to allow them to have extra curriculum activities. But a pressure of a child is going to be a different level. And I think Sister Kathy addressed that too, the peer pressure as they get older in age. And ironically, because the world is changing so quickly, what we participated in as children, um, you know, we didn't, we weren't open to so many things in our youth. There's nothing now that is private. Everything is out there. I mean, the sex. Um, personal situations, you have teenagers doing adult things online, you know, people are texting body parts to each other, and they're just children. There is so much going on that our children have matured very quickly. So you'll see even at a young age. So how a child looks and dresses becomes so important or how they wear their hair. Even little children, little kindergarten kids now are demanding what they're going to wear and what they're not going to wear. And you know, there was a time when as we were young, I don't wanna show my age, but you look, your parents bought your clothes, you put it on. If you didn't like it, then you could go to school naked because they weren't buying you nothing else. And you just dealt with it. And to you, it wasn't a bad thing, but your parents still tried to make sure that you still fit in. And the peer pressure that they have to contend with now, the levels have risen because what peer pressure was back then was here and now it's way up here. And again, as both panelists said, communication with our children is key because we have to be in tune with what's going on. And we might say, oh, please, you're making a big deal over when the parent, when the kids tell you, no, mom, I can't, I'll be embarrassed or the kids will laugh at me. We have to actually take them seriously because things have gotten to a level that we didn't have to deal with. I mean, I'm sure there were children back in the day who would go through depression and sorrow, especially the children who, who didn't have the money or their parents weren't doing as well and their clothes weren't as nice. And there was some kind of uncomfortableness and I'm sure kids teased them back then too. But it's gotten to a, a level where you're now dealing with public shame across an entire worldwide. 
It's not just the kids down the street teasing you saying, "Uh uh-huh, you can't afford today's latest fashion. You know, that kind of concept. You've got people being shamed all over the internet and social media and people are doing it because they want to increase how many likes they get or how many people, or is it going viral to them? Their own popularity is coming above and beyond the the feelings and the the um, the hurt and the cause of pain that they're creating in someone else. And children, they don't have enough knowledge to know that you know I think I'm depressed or I think I need to speak to somebody or I need to go and get some counseling or I need therapy. Children aren't taught these types of things, so they're not going to be aware of it. So what will happen is as an adult, we start to recognize certain things or we have people we can talk to who actually have common sense because we have other adults to talk to. But a child talking to a child isn't always gonna see the light and another child isn't gonna be able to help counsel your children. And so we have to acknowledge that because we don't recognize their level of life importance and and their priorities in life are equal to those of ours, they are still dealing with trauma and post-traumatic stress disorders at their levels. And we have to be open to hear what it is they're going through, what it is they're feeling. Um, I've raised, uh, I've raised my own child and I've raised, I've helped raise other people's children. And whether I like to hear things or not, because sometimes you have to actually hear things you don't want to hear, but sometimes you have to be big enough as the parent or as another adult. And of course, I'm a minister. I get to hear all sorts of things, especially from young people, because kids will come to me and tell me things that they're not going to tell their parents because they don't want to get in trouble. But you cannot be afraid to hear the truth. You have to be open and willing to listen. And you also have to let them know that I'm not happy about what you're telling me or or what you're sharing or what I'm finding out from you. But I am so glad that you told me. Because the repercussions and the fears that children have of us, sometimes, you know what? Punishment for our children sometimes is just knowing that they disappointed their parents. And that sometimes is irreparable. You cannot fix that because that damage of, oh my goodness, my mom is so disappointed in me. It'll never be the same again. She'll never trust me again, or she'll never respect me again. So we have to be so careful when we hear things we don't like, how we come to them because we need them to be able to come back. And we have to acknowledge that their problem is as big as our problem in their world. Thank you very much, Reverend Jeanette. Yeah, that was, um, again, a lot of great, great points. Um, So just want to go back to what you had said about peer pressure and the exposure of the youth nowadays. I I think that, as you mentioned, um, you know, there is a lot that our our children and youth are are being exposed to with with social media and whatnot. And the importance as well of of really being open um, as parents and caregivers to, you know, for, for our children and youth to really be able to come to to us or whoever it is. and feel comfortable that that they can share that, and that there will be no judgment, there won't be any repercussions and whatnot. Because as you mentioned, that is, um, I think oftentimes the reason why a lot of children and youth tend to suffer in silence, essentially, because they are afraid of the, the repercussions of, of some something that they've done. And I mean, children are learning um, and they are going to make mistakes as adults as well. So we, we are all, learning as as we're going along this this journey of life and take care I, I wanted to just make a comment about the no repercussions because sometimes i think there may be repercussions but i think it's important for them to know that we will deal with it together right yes whatever yes. the repercussion is because sometimes there will be right but i think it's important for them to know that and even if they feel you know they did something we have i've let you down mom or dad right 
And I think that we deal with it, we walk the journey together. Mm -hmm. So it's important for them to realize that even when they have let us down, right? Or sometimes they may think they have let us down and it, it, it's, it's not as a bad a fall or as big a drop, right? Mm -hmm. As they think, right? And I also think um, what you mentioned, mentioned um, Pastor Jenny, when you said that with the kids, it's really important that we don't ignore the situation because ignoring it is not going to let it um, go away, right? So it's important to deal with it and face it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, and I, also dealing with it teaches the kids a good lesson too, right? Because a lot of times when people make mistakes, and I think that's how you build their confidence too. A lot, you should be able to let your child say, okay, it's okay to make a mistake and to fail. We, but the important part of this is what we have learned from it because we really should be lifelong learners too, right? So I think that's an important um, point. Yeah, Just absolutely. Absolutely, Kathy. No, I, I, I like that approach that, that mm -hmm. you suggested in terms of, you know, working, working with the wor working with the child and dealing with the problem together, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what the outcome might be. And I think doing that will, I think, essentially really provide the child with that, that bit of confidence that they're, they're not left on their own to deal with with the situation that they have a caring adults, they have a, a caring parent or child giver there that, that is going to assist them. Um, because as, as was mentioned earlier in the conversation, this is why a lot of our, our, our youth are suffering in silence because they don't, they don't have that outlet, that person to go to. Mm -hmm. So creating that, um, that open communication will definitely, um, will definitely provide them with, with some, some comfort. Mm -hmm. All right. So Kathy, I want to move along to my next question for you. Mm -hmm. So Kathy, what would you consider to be the most important factor in helping Black students thrive in the Ontario education system? Yeah. So for me, without a doubt, I think it's parent, parental involvement. Because when you look at all other factors, including economic factors, right, I think parental involvement is the key. And I tell you why I think it's so important. If you just look at kids, when they first enter our educational institutions, right? All the parents in kindergarten, they're gung-ho, they're very involved, very engaged. You know, they're, they're following up and communicating with the teachers, usually have no issues, right? And then a funny thing happens as the child progresses from elementary to secondary school. So you, you literally can, if you graph it, you can literally see the decline happening and it's sort of exponentially by the time they reach um, secondary school. And I think that's a huge mistake that a lot of parents are making. Figure, oh, they're big now. Oh, they don't need us anymore. You know, and I tell parents, absolutely not. You're Kids need you at every stage of their educational journey and even beyond, even into adulthood, right? They need parent involvement is extremely important in those elementary and secondary years. And I can tell you that even having conversations, so how you have a discussion about a topic with a kindergarten, so a kinder, kinder conversation is going to look different from a conversation you're gonna have with your high school child, right? So I think that it's really important to stay connected and don't just ask these open any questions like, oh, how was school? And they're gonna go great. And then the conversation ends there, right? So even if they say great, say, what made it great? Get to find out, did anything happen um, in English class today? Did you have any tests today? You know, what did you learn? Explain. So I think it's very important to have these conversations because I tell you, when the kids are little and they, they, they're excited and they want to talk, 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 and you're tired, you just came in and like, oh, you have no interest in the latest Nintendo uh, score or you have no interest, you know, in what, you know, uh, Devon said to uh, Jackson, Right? I think it's really important to 
listen to them, even just nod and smile as you say in Jamaica, nod and smile, nod and smile, right? Let them talk because there's going to come a time when you're going to want to talk to your kids, but they won't want to talk to you. So you can't just turn up in your kid's life at age 15 and like, hey, I'm ready to talk. You look sad. That's not how it works. We have to nurture this relationship from the womb. You know, they've come out and we have to build and build because it's, it's a gradual process to build that level of confidence for your child to come with to you with a 16-year-old problem, right? So at, in kindergarten, they'd say, oh, you know, this person didn't talk to me. At, they're fine. But at age 16, with their 16-year-old problem, if you don't build that relationship, they will not be coming to you, right? And I think your parent engagement is the key they, it also shows, you know, a sign they will interpret it as care. Because I always remember my mom would tell me a story, God bless her soul, that um, she had a friend and she used to say to her friend, oh, you're so lucky. Your parents let you stay out anytime at night and you can come in. My parents are ridiculous with this curfew. It's so early. And her friend turned to her and said, well, at least your parents care. My parents didn't care where I am, right? So kids it's it's amazing how kids are really interpret that care that sense of care right so i think really important being there for the parent and if you can't always go to the parent interview at the time allotted to you or to every school council that's fine but parent engagement looks different for each family it could be as simple as making sure you send a note once a week checking in with the teacher once a month, you go to the school, whatever it looks for you, reading with your child, you're cooking, talk to the child while you're cooking. It doesn't have to be that you have to sit down at a formal setting and the child is sitting across. It could be simple. You're cooking, you're driving. Use that, what I call deadpan silence time to talk to your kids, right? Mention, you know, you hear something on the radio, say, hey, what do you think about that? Really get engaged in what, and also with their friends. How is your friend doing? Find out, you know, what they're saying, their friends are saying and what their friends are doing. Because again, like I alluded to before, it's really important to pay attention to what's happening in their friend circle, right? So the long and short of it is parent engagement is yeah. the key. If I might yeah. add, is, if yeah. that's okay. Sure, um, sure Something that uh, Sister Kathy mentioned that triggered, and I think it's important too, because I think when she was saying to communicate with them, I think we have a lot of parenting these days who want to be their children's friends. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was taboo back in the day because I can remember responding to my mother and it wasn't rude. I mean, I didn't think it was rude, but you know, you didn't, when they call you, don't go what or anything like that. And I can remember my father calling me into the living room and looking at me and I had the, the face of fear because I knew what I had done and said, who is this? And I said, my, that's mommy. And he said, oh, good. You think she's one of your friends? You think you could talk to her like your friends? And, you know, we expect a level of respect and there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same point, your children still need you to be their parent mm -hmm. because if they have friends, their friends are going to give them the advice that any friend would give. And if they're the same age, it doesn't necessarily mean that their friend knows any more than they do. Mm -hmm. And they're teaching the kids things that they shouldn't know. I mean, I'm an, I, a topic of saying the word sex. I mean, I don't want to put my, my kid out there, but <laughs> he heard the word and was running around the schoolyard when he was little, whispering it to everybody because he had heard the word and was told it was a dirty word. Um, and so I explained to him, well, it also means to be male and female. And he looked so confused and deflated. But at the same point, it's important that if we want our children to learn things, whether it's off color or not, it's best that we're on top of it so they learn the right things and not the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is going to affect some of the peer pressure that they go through as well as their confidence. Because sometimes if they don't understand something, it could cause them to feel insecure when they're actually probably the better for it. Mm -hmm. And I think too, if we make sure that there's an even kill between being 
a communicative parent and still being a parent and not trying to just be their buddy or their friend. Because at the end of the day, when something seriously goes down, your child is not going to want their friend. They're going to want a parent. They need an adult because they know that the adult will have enough sense or common sense or the strength or wisdom to be able to deal with a tough topic. And so you have to find an open balance so you can still be communicative and friendly and very casual and even joking, like she says, you know, driving, cooking, just chilling. Some people put the kids to bed, just chill out in the room for a little while before they go to bed and go, you know what? I hope you had a good day today. Did anything happen? How so-and-so? How is this going? And you have to check because children don't always share. And it's not because they don't want to share. They just don't talk about things, but you need to know, is there something happening in the class? Remember you were having difficulties with this homework. How is that going? Do you need me to help you? Do you need a tutor? All of these things, because again, the educational system is there to teach our children, but they're not maintaining our children. And so we have the responsibility of helping our children to thrive. We are an assistant to the education system because we put them in those schools and we want to make sure when we pull them out that they know everything they need and continue to get everything that they have to have and the extra to make them shine. And that's our job. If they're struggling with a topic or, or subject or something, then we have to be reasonable with them. We cannot make them feel inept. I can tell you right now, um, there are those kids who excel in everything and there are some kids who don't do well in certain things, but they're just amazing. We have to learn to help and support and encourage them in the things where they are weak. And then we have to help them shine and really point out the things that they're very good at because that helps them to feel confident. And it's like, you know what, buddy, guess what? I know you're struggling with this, but hey, you know what? You did so amazing on that and you're so good at this. I really love how you do this because it still makes them feel some self-worth. And it's kind of like you have to let them know, don't worry. The thing you're not good at, we're going to get through. We're going to do it together or we will get you help. But you know what? And even if we do get you help and you're still not good at it, you're just not good at everything. And children love when they hear that their parents have gone through some of the things they're going through because they have us up on a pedestal. They think we were born big. We were amazing from the day we came out. <laughs> well, I can't speak for myself, but I'm sure most of you were born big and just incredible when you came out. But the fact of the matter is we have to let them know that we had to grow and learn things. And if they know we had weaknesses too, and that we still have weaknesses, we are not perfect beings and we have to allow them to be imperfectly perfect. Yeah. Amen. That was yes. amazing. Amen. And you know, I, yeah. And I would say words matter. It's so important. The words we use too, we have to be careful with our language, right? So if you're trying to build confidence in our kids, you know, they make a mistake. Yeah, hey, stupid or what, right? You have to say like how you phrase things. Words matter. Just, you may tell a child one time, oh, you're so fool, fool, or your workplace, or these things. And they, it resonates and it can really profoundly affect for me. Oh, you're so ugly. Oh, you, these words, words matter, right? And it, as you said, one, a child may be good in one aspect, um, but not in another. So, help you know and and how we help to right that child who's struggling in that is is really important and i think often when we're speaking with our children we have to be very cognizant of the words that we're using you know as we try to make sure that they are confident mm -hmm. learners yeah absolutely wow i don't know about the audience but i'm i'm very happy i'm here today <laughs> I'm actually taking notes as the two of you are, are speaking. The, 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 the word thing too can be lifetime scarring too. It's very, very important. Very, very important. And it may be just a moment of lapse. 
And, and that's the other thing, we have to be accountable because if we're not accountable, we're teaching our children, they don't have to be accountable. Mm -hmm. Even as parents, we can still say sorry, or mm -hmm. I, I misunderstood, or I shouldn't have said that mm -hmm. because it teaches them how to be responsible for their actions by example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there were, there were quite a few points. I'm just trying to think of um, which one that stands out, but definitely what you said, Reverend Jeanette, about being relatable to children, I think is, is really important because as children are growing, they often look at adults like they, they're perfect and that they don't make mistakes and that they weren't children at one point. And I, I um, definitely agree, agree with you that, you know, I think that that is what creates that uh, relatableness with, with children and also will allow them to feel com comfortable that they can, they can come to, you know, their parent or caregiver and, um, and really be able to, to relate to them, definitely. And, um, and I want to go back to what, um, to what you said as well, Jeanette, you started off by talking about um, parents being treated as though they're their friends, you know, so I, I know that, you know, this is very prevalent in, in the Caribbean, for most Caribbean homes in terms of, you know, you don't, you don't speak a certain way, definitely, you don't speak a certain way to, to your parents and, uh, and whatnot. So thank you for, for highlighting that, definitely. Um, and I want to just backtrack really quickly. Um, I know we're getting close to time here. Uh, so with what, Kathy, what you mentioned about the parental involvement mm -hmm. in the education system, I think is, is absolutely critical. Um, and in, in terms of, you know, the way you highlighted that the difference from the parental engagement from kindergarten up into the high school years and how it can sort of diminish as as time time goes on. Um, and it's funny, I, I had never really thought of it before in, in that, that perspective, but um, I think you, you brought some, some good, shed some good light on that in the sense that, you know, I think a lot of uh, parents and caregivers, you know, in kindergarten, they're very excited and very, you know, overly involved as well as the, the children as well. They're very eager to share, you know, their experience and how their day went. And then as they get older, they start talking less the parents start engaging less mm -hmm. um, and sort of keeping that consistent from kindergarten all the way to grade 12, I think is, uh, is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. um, and Takia, mm -hmm. I, I, I just wanted to jump into, cause something I forgot to mention when I speak in, in with regards to parent involvement too, was even how we treat, for example, our children's report card, right? So being engaged, looks very different at all levels. And I think a lot of times as parents, we don't engage in our kids' report cards. A lot of, you know, from growing up as a, you know, my dad St. Lucia, my mom's Jamaican, was Jamaican, and, you know, I'm married to Trini, so, you know, I, I kind of ha have an idea of the Trini household thing, right? And a lot of times we have this attitude, well, you know, you're not going to get an education from me and, uh, you know, you're supposed to get a good report card. And I said, when we have that attitude, it's kind of hypocritical because when we look in the workforce, right, as adults, when we work hard and we do a report or we, we have saved the company X money, we get bonuses, we do all these things and we want to be recognized for all this amazing work we're doing in our workplaces. But our kids come home with their report card and it's like, ah, great, whatever, we don't. And I think we have a duty to celebrate the wins of our report card. And again, that boosts your kids like, wow, right? Because we have to let our kids know that we appreciate what they are doing and we see them, we understand the hard work they're doing. So at the end of the day, yes, they're not getting education for us, they're getting it for themselves, right? And setting themselves up. But I think we have to remember to acknowledge their hard work, right? Because, hey, we as adults, we like when we get acknowledged at work, right? So I think we have to, that's another thing I think that um, we should pay attention to um, in terms of really being involved, like even the comments, read those comments on the report card. And you can say, oh, you know, the teacher was saying, you, oh, you're very good. You always take good initiatives or you're collaborative. So recognize, you know, go through their report card and don't just take it and, 
you know, put it down and you have checked, you have seen the report card. Mm -hmm. Talk I think we should take that one step further and not just the report card, because I know we can be harsh when they're not doing well as, mm -hmm. as opposed to when they're doing it, but we need to celebrate all their wins. Yeah. All of them, everything, not just the report card, because yeah. to them, you know, your first triumph in your child's life is you. Mm -hmm. It sounds silly, but the one person that they're looking for affirmation and confirmation and they, you know, remember when they were in kindergarten and they were up in the school play and it didn't matter or they were just singing at Christmas or whatever, mm -hmm. they'll stand there. They don't care that the whole school is there and that all their friends are there. They're looking mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. And they don't care what's going on. They will defy the teacher because you know the teacher told them, don't wave at anybody, just stand there, look nice, smile. And they don't care. The teacher's not looking, they're going to wave because they want to make sure you saw them. Mm -hmm. Your children are begging for your attention and most of all, approval. Absolutely. That was very well said, Reverend Jeanette. Um, yeah, no, it, it's it's very true because I think oftentimes that um, a lot of children and youth really they do look at at their parents for for that that affirmation to know that they're on the right path, mm -hmm. and I think that that often even after once they they leave childhood, adolescence, even into adulthood, you know, I think oftentimes even as adults. Um, oftentimes adults are still still seeking seeking for that that approval and that affirmation from their parents to know that um, that what they're doing is a is a, is a good job because I know that you know some some parents are a little can be a little bit more opinionated <laughs> um, than others. I'm sure our audience members can also agree and our panelists can also agree that you know. Um, I'm sure maybe, maybe one parent growing up for you personally has been more opinionated um, and maybe you've been sort of seeking more approval from one, one parent than, than the next. Um, so I just want to take a look at the chat. Um, I do see that, that there has been a few comments in the chat. So I just want to make sure that we take a look at everything that's there before we close out for the, uh, for the afternoon. Um, so I see here, so Miss Joan Simmons, she said that once confidence is instilled in, in children, how is that sustained, especially as we know, there is so much peer pressure around them. For sure. Do either of you want to continue with, with um, that question? I want to make sure I understood the question. Can you repeat that again? Sure. So once confidence is instilled in children, how is that sustained, especially mm. as we know, there is so much peer pressure around them. And you know, it's funny, it's, a, it's not even a matter of how is it sustained, you have to maintain it. It's an ongoing battle, it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I'm, I'm in my age, <laughs> that's all I'll say. <laughs> Be nice, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still a child. I'm thankful I still have one parent. And as far as I'm concerned, she's going to be with us forever. <laughs> but uh, she still has to maintain developing my confidence. And you don't stop. And so your process and procedure may change because of the situation or the circumstance. But the procedure itself of maintaining confidence has to continue. You just basically restructure it because once the Kathy says, you know, you, you went from grade school to university and college, and then you went to the workplace. We're always looking to do a good job. We're always looking to be accepted and we're always looking for appreciation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can build up your child's confidence all you want throughout all those years and then send them off to the work world and they have a family and then their confidence can just totally bomb because, you know, they end up working with a bunch of bullies or they end up working with someone who's horrible and treats them so poorly and says, I can't believe we hired you, you know, you're just useless. And, you know, so how a person maintains it 
they still have to learn those same affirmations of encouragement and they're still going to need it from their outside sources. It's just now the parental structure might have changed a little bit more because now they're getting confidence from their friends who are older and wiser. They're getting confidence now from fellow co-workers and maybe other people in society that they may know or not even know because sometimes a good word from strangers can build up a person's confidence. I always tell everybody, oh, I love your hair. Oh, I love your clothes. Oh, your outfit's great. You're just, I always speak my mind because I'm not trying to build people's confidence, but I know that if I can say something nice to somebody and let them know how I feel, it's important. And you just never know when that may be the last words that will actually make them finally break out and bloom. Mm -hmm. And we have to water, we have to allow them to shine. We have to give them the ray of sunshine around them. And so as your children get on in years, you still have to leave communication open. You still have to be open to hear them. You still have to be willing to not want to listen to some horrible things because as they get older, it's going to get scary, the things you are going to have to listen to. Mm -hmm. But you have to accept the fact that they're growing and they're developing into their own people and you have to help to continue to build that. And the only thing I'd like to add to that is Remember when Barack Obama first got elected as president and his mom died, didn't see him being sworn in, all right, but knew he was president-elect. And he mentioned, and this is a grown man, right? And just what knowing that, you know, when you heard his speech about the, the importance of his mom, you know, knowing there and being there, you realize that at every stage of your life, right? you still, that confidence is a journey because you have some people that you say, oh, they were so confident in their youth. And then you see them, you know, 20 years down the road and they're a shell of themselves. Something has happened, right? So it, I would agree 100%, you have to maintain it. It's not something that, okay, I've given, you know, root confidence and I can just walk away now. It's a lifelong journey. And I think I remember Speaking of strangers, I remember once after a particularly grueling board meeting, you know, I just like, I'm done. I'm not even running again. I, I'm fed up, you know. And at that particular meeting, I remember it was um, a Black person who was actually driving me insane. We'd think that, oh, as a Black person, you would support the initiative of targeting hiring and trying to get more Black representation in a school board. Like, why wouldn't you, Right. And you, you, you're just so fed up and I just like, I'm done. And a lady out of the blue, I have never met this woman. She came up to me and she said, I just, I was in a supermarket, right? The day after. And she just said, I just want to thank you for all that you do. And you know, I wouldn't even be where I am without you fighting for our rights. And she goes on, she hugs me and she walks away. I, I couldn't even identify this lady today, right? But just that lady encouraging me and giving the confidence, gave me that confidence to continue this journey because I was just like so frustrated and so fed up and just like, this is pointless. And then that lady just said this, her words to me and it changed my whole trajectory, right? Because honestly, I was just so frustrated with what was going on at the time. And so, you know, people, you get confidence in all kinds of places, but guess what? You can also get people breaking your confidence in all kinds of places too, right? So that's why it's so important to maintain and work on maintaining it. And as parents, keep making sure, because you could have a child, you know, she got the English award, she's doing well, but her friend is jealous and starts attacking her on social media. So you have to work with that child and keep building up her confidence, right? And say, oh, you, somebody might say, oh, you're, you're trying to be right because you're smart, you know? So she gets all these awards, but she's been attacked for being too white because you're smart, right? Or whatever the situation is. And I think it, you know, just establishing confidence in a kid doesn't mean you just wash, get to wash your hands and walk away and say, great, I've done my job. It's up every day. It's a journey. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you to both of you ladies. Um, I think you guys gave some really good some really good examples and some feedback on how to go about sustaining, sustaining that, that confidence, which I think is the key word there is really just sustaining that confidence. Um, because as, as both of you mentioned, you know, there, there could be external factors trying to, to break your confidence and really just being prepared for that at all times. Um, so I do want to just let our audience know that if anybody has any questions um, or any comments or whatnot, to please leave them in the chat. Um, if you also raise your hand, uh, we can also spotlight you and you can also join the conversation. So I just wanna put that out there to all of our, all of our audience members. Uh, okay, so I'm just going through the chat here. There was another question. Um, Maybe we'll wrap it up with, with this, one, this one question here, unless somebody else has another question um, from the audience. Uh, so there's a question in the chat that says, does the way one, one dresses a reflection of confidence? So maybe, maybe we, can, we can sort of end, wrap up our conversation um, on that note. Is, do you feel that um, the way that one dresses is a reflection of confidence? Not necessarily. There's um, a saying that even when you're going through depression or sorrow or sadness or moments of healing after not being well, however, they say to get up, dress up and show up. And I think there are times when I'm feeling my worst is when I look my very best because you put more effort into trying to project the feeling of being okay. And if you can't feel okay from the inside, you try to fix up the outside because you don't want everyone to know you're not okay. So, I mean, there are times when, yes, you can go ahead and, you know, you would just say, okay, I'm feeling confident today and I'm going to dress the part. And that does happen, but I don't necessarily correlate dressing and how you reflect yourself fashion wise with confidence or not being confident because there are a lot of people who are confident and they have no sense of fashion so you know we can we can look at it from all all aspects I did mention earlier though that children can be unfair when it comes to fashion and and children have to the peer pressure aspect of it. I think that is the greatest part of it. As you get older, you you become a part of your dress however you feel. And you're not always so much dressing for other people. But with children, it could be a detriment when they're not able to dress in fashionable or the current fashion clothes or designer clothes um, because children can be tough on people. But uh, I think in that sense, then, then it would help to be able to help them build confidence if they're able to dress a little better or have a few good outfits, you know what I mean? But as an adult, I don't think confidence is based on how you dress so much. And sometimes it could be an affordability factor too. Yeah. And I think what is even more important in my opinion than your actual dress is your posture. Because a lot of times when kids aren't confident, you can see they, they slouch, they, do, they look down, they don't make eye contact. So a lot of times your body language and your posture tells a lot about your confidence and what you're going to through, sorry. And again, sometimes you will maybe feeling down and say, I'm not going to, because you, know, you, you may be nervous about something or not particularly confident about um, a particular meeting, but you, you're going to say, I'm not going to let them see me sweat. So, you know, you, you, walk upright and you try to act the part, right? But sometimes you're quaking inside, right? So I think it's it's like a yes and no. It's sometimes, it does, it's not all the time. That's how I'd answer that um, question. I think there are many other signs to look for apart from just dress to determine whether somebody is confident or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Reverend Jeanette and to, to Kathy. Thank you for being here um, this afternoon. Um, I guess before we wrap up, do you, either of you have any, any last few words, maybe in about 30 seconds? Any last few words that you wanna leave with our audience? 
Well, I'd just like to say thank you um, to Donna for this amazing opportunity and the entire team. Thank you to my co-panelists, to my wonderful moderator, and you know, for the audience or anyone listening on YouTube on the live stream. If you have any issues with regards to anything in education, it doesn't matter what board your child is or your nevi or niece, please feel free to contact me at Kathy, K A T H Y dot McDonald, M C D O N A L D, at peelsb.com, and I will direct you to the appropriate channels. And this has been quite an uh, enjoyable even afternoon. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I, I would also like to say thank you as well. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, again, 100 ABC, the alumni, um, Sister Donna, of course, for always putting these amazing things together. Um, I want to say to everybody else that healing is important and self-worth and value is very important. And so whether you're confident or not, you need to be around people who are going to encourage you, who are going to support you, and certainly lift you up. And if you're not in that type of environment or you're not with people who will do that, then you really need to rethink it because they can make or break you and it makes a lifetime of difference. And you know what? We always say every child matters, but I like to believe that everybody matters. So in that aspect of it, you truly do matter and you need to be where you can be safe, where you can be with safe people and you can have a, an inner peace of safety and knowing who you are. And in my, in my realm of religion, whose you are. But thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Wonderful. Thank you again to both of you, ladies. Thank you again, Miss to Reverend Jeanette and to Kathy, thank you for, for being here and uh, allowing me to be your, your moderator this afternoon. Thank you, it has been an absolute pleasure and uh, I have taken some, some very great notes on all of the, the, the tips that you shared with us. And I hope the audience, I hope, and those on YouTube Live, I hope that you uh, were able to take away some very um, insightful information as well. And at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Donna Jones Simmons to close us out. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much again for joining us today. This was an awesome, awesome conversation. You know, I just get goosebumps every single week as you speak. I just wanna also acknowledge our dear Nicole Waldron who is in the background. She has been doing our technical work for us. And moderator, our panelists, you were just awesome. And I knew this was going to be awesome. Uh, we missed Michelle, but she did an awesome job as well. They were experts. And I encourage our audience, really encourage our audience to really replay the YouTube and share it with your children, share it with teachers, share it with educators, share it with parents. <laughs> These topics are so important that we must just share them. That's the whole purpose, to pass on these nuggets and these amazing conversations to to generations and generations to come so thank you audience have an amazing week if we don't see you or hear from you next week i want to take this opportunity to wish you a very very happy holiday season and a very happy and healthy 2023 take care everyone love you on your own but never alone through the rain and through the shine here's your moment it's your time you stood tall and now you see Standing in your destiny One